This is The Fit Mess with Zach and Jeremy. Hi there. Thanks so much for listening to the show. This is The Fit Mess. My name is Jeremy and his name is Zach. What's up, everyone? And we're focusing a lot on this show in the last few weeks and in the, a couple weeks ahead on mental health issues, emotional health issues. It's uh, Suicide Prevention Awareness Month. So we've really put a lot of time into trying to help folks that are struggling with these kinds of issues. And it just seems like the more we all try and adapt to what's going on in the world, some other curveball keeps getting thrown at us as as a planet, as a people. It's the, This has gotten so much bigger than just job stress and life stress and parenting stress and all the things. The world just feels very out of control. I'm not an anxious person, but my anxiety has been off the charts these last few days. With everything that's going on in the world, anxiety is is on high for loads and loads of people right now. And you've you've had a, a pretty uh, off the charts week yourself, Zach. Uh, it's been an, it's been an interesting week in in the anxiety world. I read as many books on anxiety as I possibly can. I would and imagine just, that makes you even more anxious. Um, no, because it really it it really so the story that I have really paints the pictures to. Once you understand how something works, you're able to treat it a mm -hmm. little bit better, right? I mean, there's there's cause and effect, and then there's in the middle of it, like how that thing caused the effect, right? Right. Um, so, you know, traumatic history, anxiety today, right? The, what is it about that traumatic history? So I was reading about the amygdala and how it can store emotional memories and if you have something that happens to you that's really highly emotional, it'll store that memory and then you're reminded of it. So think about all the times you smell something that reminds you of childhood or, you know, something like that. Mm -hmm. If you had that experience before, so, literally like two nights ago, like randomly don't even know where the smell came from, but I was suddenly like 12 years old again. It was the nice. weirdest thing. Yeah. I'm curious. What did you smell that brought you back to a 12 year old boy? I don't even know what the smell was. I think it was just like the smell of the sheets or something, but it just, it reminded me of dating this girl, like, you know, dating when you're 12 or whatever, but like you're this childhood crush that just like, I remember this, the smell that reminded me of her. It was really weird. Nice. So that that's exactly it, right? The, it, it stores memories and it, you know, that part of your brain has the ability to override everything else in your brain and react instantly so, you know, if you ever walk around a corner and you jump because you think somebody's standing there and it's really just a coat right. hanging on the door, right? That's your amygdala actually having a response based on a memory okay. um, and, and reacting, right? That saved our lives on many occasions, right? Mm -hmm. So what can happen is if you have some kind of an emotional experience, it can actually manifest itself later on in life where you act a certain way or you feel something in a situation that you can't really explain. Mm -hmm. And I've always had this nagging fear of just going out and doing anything. So think about like if I'm driving home, I have to stop and get gas. Something about stopping to get gas bothered me and I'd have to fight through my anxiety to actually like pull in and get the gas, mm. right? Going to the grocery store, going to a store, going out to do anything. There's always that little nag there that I'd be like, why, why, why does this bother you? Come on, just go, you know, get off is your that, ass. And is go. that true whether you're at home or just at all? So when I'm on like vacation, if I'm away from my home, mm -hmm. I'm actually okay. Okay. It's only, it's only when I'm home. And when I tell you the story, it'll all make sense. Okay. So I was reading this book and it was talking about this and that specific fear came up and I've never thought too much of it because it really is just, it's very subtle. You know, it doesn't keep me from going to the store to get a pint of ice cream if I really want one. Right. right? It's, is it? It's so, it's it's like a deja vu level anxiety. I wouldn't like, even call it deja vu. It's just like I have to go somewhere. Oh shit. Okay. Kind of thing. Right. It just just a very very slight feeling. See, I have that, but I'm just lazy. I just don't want to go anywhere. That's that's my thing. Well, there's a little <laughs> bit of that too, but um, there's definitely some kind of trigger that happens. Right. There's an emotional process, and there's my heart rate goes up a little. Um, just it, again, it's so slight mm. and I'm so used to it now that I don't even think anything of it, but I was going through this book and it was talking about how certain past experiences can imprint and 
then later in life we have these experiences like, huh, I wonder if that has anything to do with like something I experienced right years ago. And it like hit me like a gut punch of, you know, when I was 12 or so, I had the CD collection, you know, Pearl Jam, Nirvana, everything you would have loved. Mm-hmm. But there, there were some kids that I was hanging out with who are not the greatest people to be hanging out with. And they were in my room and they were commenting on how great the CDs were. And I didn't think anything of it. But then two days later, I came home and all my CDs were gone. Oh, geez. Right. So. Right. I told my dad, he called the cops, somebody had come in, you know, cause somebody came in the house and stole CDs. And I was like, yeah, I'm pretty confident. I know who it is. It's these two guys. Sure enough, the cops went and, you know, found all my CDs and they're like, Hey, here's the bet. These are your CDs. Right. I was like, yep. And they're like, okay, well you can have them back in like three months. Cause we're, we need them for evidence. Oh, God. I was like, ah. But anyway, so that all went down. Those, those kids got in trouble. And it, they were part of like a, a larger group of kids. And I just remember walking down the street one day and they were coming the other way. And this is one af- of them. After the fact? Like after this it, whole? Yep. Okay. This is after the whole thing yeah. happened. And one of them, whom I had seen, just utterly beat senseless somebody for nothing. Like he was like, picture um, Joe Pesci in Casino, right? Mm-hmm. Like that kind of crazy. Yeah. And he just walked up to me and, and was like, you better watch your fucking back. Oh, you know, because there, there was a cop across the street. So there was nothing he could do right there. Right. He said that. And for like the next few months, I was afraid to leave the house. Like if I did leave the house, I made my buddy come over and he'd if I was going to his house, he'd come over to my house and then we'd walk together over to his house. Mm-hmm. And then it all passed and I completely forgot about it. And it just it hit me like a ton of bricks that like this general unease of just going out to the gas station, going and doing anything is all tied back to, you know, that that emotional experience that I had of of a dude who was threatening to kick my ass. And now my, you know, 30 years later, I'm still hesitant to go to the store to pick up something for a project. Right. Just. Yeah. Almost. It almost brought me to tears. Just like having that realization. Yeah. But with that is like so much power, like just I know what it is now. Like if I have those thoughts, I can actually counteract it now. You know, I can reprogram that thought as opposed to just going, oh, whatever. I don't know what that is, but I'm going to push through and go. I imagine a lot of people of a certain age have a, a similar reaction. I know for me, and I think this has morphed over the years, but for a long time, I couldn't wake up without immediately checking the news in whatever format that was, my phone. TV, whatever, after 9-11, because I woke up and the world was at war in a way that I had never known in my lifetime. And so I think that has evolved to the the standard, you know, wake up and check the phone addiction that most of us have. But I think for me, that's where that was born, was this sense of when I wake up, oh my God, what happened? Like, yep. what happened while I was asleep that I need to what now did, react to? What did I miss? Yeah. So... You've discovered a tool. You've discovered a way to reprogram that thought process. It is definitely a tool. It's my tool of, you know, how I can work with my anxiety because, I mean, that that memory is so imprinted that it's going to fire every time. But now I know why. Now I know the cause. So when it does fire, I can actually tell myself, no, you're okay. Everything is fine. You can go to the store. No one's going to beat you up when you go to the store. Mm -hmm. I mean, maybe if I walk down the aisle the wrong way, but, (laughs) you know. No mask and going the wrong way. No mask, (laughs) But but I recognize, like, where that feeling is coming from, and that allows me to actually treat it better, right? I can say, hey, this is not a problem. This was a problem a long time ago. Thank you, you know, worry brain for, you know, activating and trying to protect me, but this is not an issue anymore, right? The yeah. more and more and more I do that, it'll train that that functionality out of me. Yeah. So you mentioned that that you had this realization while reading this book. Was it just were you just blindsided by this memory, or did you did you somehow engage uh, with yourself to discover where that where that anxious memory came from? I think a little bit of both because I have thought about the memory over the years, but I mm-hmm. never tied it to anything. Mm-hmm. And I've thought about the unease of going out, but never tied it, tied it to anything. Mm-hmm. So they've both always, 
been there. It was just as I was reading this, for some reason, it just it hit me out of out of nowhere mm-hmm. that that unease is because of that one experience. Yeah, um, I love I love those it, moments. I love that when when your body that we've, we've talked so much about that on this show, especially lately, like that inner voice, that inner guide, for whatever reason. It, it hits you when you're least expecting it, when that thing that you've never processed, that thing you've never dealt with, that you've just carried around for a week, a month, a decade, it it will make you deal with it one way or another. Mm-hmm. And that's a perfect example of, a, I'm just reading the 8,000th book about anxiety, and, yeah. that, and your body finally goes, dummy, look here. And there yeah. it is. But And that just, you know, like you said, it's... I've read so many books, so many podcasts, so many resources on anxiety. I should be an expert, but at the same, like I can talk about it, Mm -hmm. but the inner workings of my own mind are still, you know, mysterious in some way, shape or form. Yeah. Um, And there's always going to be stuff to learn. I think if I ever get myself a hundred percent fixed, I'll be bored. Yeah. I won't have anything to work on. And I don't think that's even possible. No, it's it's, there's no way to, to, to just be blissfully happy every minute of every day of the rest of your life, there's, there's always going to be shit. And it's, that's the whole point of this thing is, is to yep. work through that stuff. Yeah. So, you know, anxiety is near and dear to my heart and it's just to help people understand anxiety is about the future, right? Mm-hmm. You're, you're constantly worried about something that may happen. Mm-hmm. Um, whereas depression is a lot of, um, living in the past, mm-hmm. um, regretting things that have happened, being down on, you know, life so far. And then there's the middle where the power of now comes in, right? Mm-hmm. If you can live in the middle, it's it's an okay place to be. But anxiety is has always been my problem. It's always been like, what happens next? How do we do this? What What's the next plan? What's the next thing that I have to do? Mm-hmm. And it's so hard for me to pull back from that and just be like, okay, rest for a second, dude. Right. And it's interesting in both cases, whether it's anxiety or depression, I was just having a conversation about this the other night because um, somebody I know was talking with a life coach who was advising someone on um, when you have those negative thoughts, whether it's you know guilt for not being enough or worry about the future or whatever, that life coach was expressing the idea that, that you have to stop those thoughts, that you have to you have to push back against them, which I think is wrong. I think is the wrong advice. I think that you need to like sort of the first day, the band aid you put on that is that you note it. You just acknowledge mm-hmm. it. Just okay. I'm I'm depressed right now. I'm anxious right now, and so much of the time, and I can't tell you how many thousands of times I have been depressed, been aware that that's all I needed to do, but the depression says, yeah, nah, we're we're good. Let's just hang mm-hmm. right here. But just having the ability to go, oh, I'm depressed. Oh, I'm anxious, and just labeling it takes like ninety percent of it away. It just, mm-hmm. it makes you, oh, okay, that's what that is. That, that's what that horrible driving feeling is that I can't get away from. And just by doing that, the remaining 10% is where you do the work, where you acknowledge, well, where did that come from? Why am I feeling this way? If, if you can just note it, it will calm it down. And if you have the time to spend with that thought or with that feeling, and you can just quietly allow it so often your body will tell you, this is why, this is where this mm-hmm. is coming from. And then you can start the process like you're talking about, about tra- changing your relationship with that memory and that experience so that you can function in a healthier way with it. Yeah. You're not going to be able to stop the thought. No. What you can do, though, is have, you can add an additional thought to it mm-hmm. that paves a different neural pathway, right? Yeah. If you can lay down new ground that goes along with the thought, eventually that old thought you will get rid of it mm-hmm. and the new one will take over, but it, it's, it's not anything that you can just go, I'm going to stop thinking that. Right. Yeah. You have to put something in its place. You have to put some other tool or mechanism so you can build that other road. Well, and that's, I think I've told this story probably a couple times on this show, but the time that I, uh, in, in a just random middle of the day meditation had this traumatic experience as a child that I, I somehow went back to as an adult and comforted myself through that experience. And my relationship with that moment today is vastly different. I almost never think about it the way that I did. And when I do, I no longer see what I saw as a child. I see me comforting the child version of me 
and giving mm-hmm. me what I needed. And I have such a healthier relationship with that traumatic experience now because I took the time and processed it and allowed it to 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 make itself known so that I could change the story, to change the way that it affected me. Mm-hmm. It's just, it's life-changing when you can do that stuff, when you give yourself the time and you give those feelings the attention and don't try to stuff them down like so many and, of us do. And being creative with it too, right? I mm-hmm. mean, so you can stuff, you, you don't stuff it down, but also, you know, he, here's another one for me. So unfortunately for, for somebody with my high anxiety, mm-hmm. I have uh, something called thoracic outlet syndrome. So the nerve bunch in my shoulder is, is the muscles around it uh, are really tight mm-hmm. and cause the nerves, they, it causes me pain. Mm-hmm. What it manifests as is chest pain, mm-hmm. tingling fingers, pain in my shoulder, textbook heart attack symptoms. Mm-hmm. And it's on my left side too. Yeah. So, you know, I get all of this stuff. I also have a really low resting heart rate. It's like 55 beats a minute mm-hmm. for my resting heart rate. Yeah. With that low of a resting heart rate, your heart has to pump really hard, right? So if I just go quiet, and this is why I can't stand meditation, my heartbeat, right. like my whole body shakes. <laughs> like if I have my legs crossed, you can see one of my legs moving up and down to my heart. Oh my God. It's just, it's powerful. Yeah. So, you know, I will get one of these bouts of like all these shoulder pains and the, you know, the the heart attack symptoms. But then it's that moment where I focus in and I'm like, oh, my God, I can feel my heart, too. Mm -hmm. And I'm having a heart attack. Right. And then that spirals. And now it's been it was such a traumatic experience for me that now whenever I feel my heart beat, even without the pain, I panic. Uh And I had to I had to get okay with that. And it was this really, really stupid thing that I had going in my head where it was every time my heart I could feel my heart. Mm-hmm. I pictured in my head my heart actually talking to me and going, dude, I got this. Wow. I got it. It's okay. Wow. I'm beating. I'm okay. Yeah. And just pictured my heart telling me it was okay. And every time it happened, I just, I pictured that. And it's so stupid. But now when I feel it, when I feel my heartbeat, mm-hmm. that's all I see is my heart telling me it's okay. Right. And it totally passes. That's but so interesting. Took years to get there. So, well, and I, I don't know, we don't have to go into this if you don't want to, but you had an issue as a child. Just yeah, I had, a heart, physical. I had a heart murmur. I had a heart murmur when I was a baby that I didn't have to have surgery. It naturally corrected itself. Mm-hmm. Um, but I've, my entire life I've had chest pains and like I was, I remember being eight or nine years old and in the emergency room because I was having heart attack symptoms mm-hmm. and I've just always had this. So like my brain is just it is locked into anything that's related to my heart. Well, and that's um, that's what I was curious about. Is 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 this another example of childhood trauma that the story you were told was your heart's messed up, and then yep. you carry that with you into adulthood? And every time your left arm twinges, you're like, "Oh God, here we go!" Yeah. <laughs> but it's not even. It wasn't even my left arm. I got to a point where, like, if every now and again you get that random pain that's like really sharp, and then it just goes away. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I'd get that in my right foot and I'd be like, oh, my heart, it's my heart. It's going to blow up, right? It was anything that happened anywhere in my body, it, my brain just instantly went, my heart's blowing up. Oh, my God. I, so, I, I had a similar thing the other and I know that feeling you're talking about. I had just this random, my left arm just hurting, middle of the day, no reason, just working away, not doing anything. And I had this this moment of, oh God, what if, what if I'm having a heart attack? I have no reason to think I'm having, I'm a relatively healthy dude. I've had blood tests recently. Everything's good. But I started panicking like, oh God, what if I'm having a heart attack? And then I started getting nauseous, which is mm-hmm. another sim- symptom. And I'm like, oh God, this is really happening. But then sitting with that for a minute, I was like, oh wait, no, I'm just panicking. That's all. The, I, <laughs> I just need to calm down. It's just an arm pain. Yeah. It's no big deal. But then, you know, I'm, I'm Googling heart attack symptoms you know, while I'm doing all this. And then I'm flashing to a friend of mine who died from a heart attack and on her bed was her Kindle where she was searching heart attack symptoms. Oh, and so, so I'm making all those connections in my head. Like <laughs> this is how it was. This, this it's happening now. With all that, you should have more issues with this than I do. <laughs> I really should at this point. I'm, I'm creating all new pathways with my heart now. It's uh, as I reach my forties. 
Um, but yeah, it's, you know, that, that stuff, it just sticks with you. That trauma sticks with you. And if you don't deal with it, you will eventually. Yeah. But, it, but again, I like back to the point of when you can name it, you can do something about it. When you can do something about it, you know, get creative with it. Cause my, when I picture my heart in my head mm-hmm. talking to me, it's got arms and it's got a face. Interesting. Yeah. Like I, it's... I always had to, I always had to, um, personify my depression and it, mm-hmm. it's just like this like volcanic black ball of anger and like that's, but I have to like visualize it to, to separate from it. <laughs> that's a really awesome description. <laughs> Isn't it? Of depression. <laughs> <laughs> but I feel like that's what consumes me. But as soon as I picture it externally, yeah. then I can begin to separate from it. Right, right. But anyways, that's beside the point. So yeah, I haven't. I didn't die of a heart attack today. That's good. But, that's good. But not today. Oh, I and I joke. I joke all the time. And part of me is very serious about it because my the chest pains that I do get, it's all related to nerves and mm-hmm. um, tight muscles, and usually. Um, a little bit of yoga helps out. So mm-hmm. I always joke, like the day I do have a real one, I'm going to be like, oh, no, 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 I'm fine. I, I, I just need some downward dog. I'll, yeah. I'll be fine. And then you'll um, face plant into the mat and that'll be it. Exactly. And then I'll, I'll, I'll be done for on a yoga mat. <laughs> the yoga session will literally kill me. <laughs> you know, it's funny you mentioned the, uh, you know, naming it to, to be able to get it under control. Our, our friend Mark Brackett told us a year ago the concept he brings up name it to tame it like that is such a a simple thing to just keep in the back of your mind name it to tame it because when you're dealing with that stuff as soon as you shine that light on it that's when you can start to get it under control so uh you know his book is permission to feel we're actually going to be talking to him again here in a couple of weeks it's a just he's just been on an amazing um whirlwind since that book came out it's it's changed a lot of people's lives and, and been really powerful but but you mentioned you were reading a book when you had this uh, this sort of epiphany, this this light bulb moment. Is what what book were you reading? Yeah, so um, a lot of the books that I read. Um, so one of my favorites is called The Anxiety Toolkit by Alice Boys, and you know a lot of these books go into um, what is anxiety, and they give you some tools and techniques for combating the anxiety. Mm-hmm. But the one that I was reading um, this time is a book called Rewire Your Anxious Brain. Mm-hmm. So right off the bat, it's different because it's talking about, you know, how do you change the process? How do you lay down that new track, that new road so your, your, your mind can go a different way. But it's, um, it's by Catherine Pittman, but this book is a little bit different in that the first half of it is like, Hey, this is what anxiety is. And I always read that again, because it's so interesting to, to hear it described in different ways. And sometimes it opens up, but it goes into what is anxiety? Here's some tools and techniques that you can maybe do. But then it talks about the actual science behind how your amygdala was designed to react and, and put you into fight or flight. And, you know, depending on, you may have an overactive amygdala that is like a a smoke detector, right? Mm. And it goes off when there's no smoke. And so you go into that fight or flight all the time when you shouldn't be. And it's trained to do that and it hijacks your brain all the time. Mm-hmm. So you've got to, you've got to flip the script on it and write a different story to calm it down and work with it. Um, so it, it's a really good book. Obviously it led me to a nice epiphany that brought up a story that's slightly embarrassing, but you know what? It, it's helping me get better. So I don't care. So as we're wrapping things up here, Zach, you know, we've talked a lot about the problems, about you know, how we've sort of identified them. So what is the takeaway? If, if somebody's trying to apply this to their own relationship with anxiety, what should they be aware of? So I think the important thing to remember is, you know, when you are in a moment where your, your anxiety is heightened, it's really important to ask yourself the question, what is the evidence of this being true? Right. Show me the evidence of of something being true. Um, in my case, right, heart attack symptoms, right. What, while those do present themselves as as a um, a real heart attack, you can't calm a heart attack down by taking deep breaths, right. So, right. right I use that. I take some deep breaths. Do they go away? Well, the evidence is I'm not having a heart attack. Mm-hmm. Um, or if you're nervous about going to a store, right, because you had some traumatic thing in in the past. 
right? What's the evidence that I have anything to worry about here? And right? and I would add an addendum to that because there is a I have a tendency with stuff like that where, you know, what's the harm of going to whatever the thing is? Oh, because every time I go, there's no parking. I get a ticket. Somebody hits like I can I can attach myself to four or five bad things that have happened, but those don't equate to that means this is going to happen again. Right. So I think that's I think that's important to to keep in mind that just because things have happened that have been negative in the past, it doesn't it doesn't mean it's evidence that it's going to happen again now. Right. You'll you'll get a feeling of an emotion that something could happen, but the reality is whatever you did experience probably won't happen again. Right. So that's that's my thing. That's what I have to ask myself all day when my anxiety kicks in is what's the evidence that this is actually true? Mm-hmm. Like show me show me the evidence. And 90% of the time, I'll even go higher. 98% of the time, I can't <laughs> find any evidence. Right. And and I know to drop it. And it, it's so common. Yeah. And again, once you've done that, that just that that simple identification seems to resolve whatever the underlying issue is most of the time. Most of the time. My one last story mm-hmm. quickly is I my anxiety. I didn't know I had an anxiety until about six years ago, I think. And I went in and officially got tested because I thought I might be slightly anxious at the the suggestion of my wife. Mm-hmm. And I went through the whole testing process and was like, yeah, you know, I think, you know, I'm a little bit anxious. I think about things, but it's nothing, it's nothing outrageous. Um, and I went and got the test, like the top of the scale is 10. She's like, you scored a 16 on it. So like off the charts anxious. And it was really, it was very freeing that day. Like I was really pissed off to know that I was that anxious, Mm -hmm. but didn't think I was that anxious. Right. But I, but it got named. And then I started to tame it and figure it out. So just like we said a couple of times here, just naming what the issue is allows you to actually take action on it to lay down that new track. Yep. And to read, as you've done, thousands and thousands of books on the on the subject so that you can become an expert and mm-hmm. apply as much of it as possible to your own mind. Yes. But the mind is is super complicated and and really fussy about change. It doesn't like to to do things differently. Yeah. For sure. Well, that's where we'll wrap things up for this week. As I mentioned, uh, Mark Brackett, the author of Permission to Feel, he's actually going to join us on our next episode. So that will be uh, available next Wednesday at our website, thefitmess.com. If you haven't already, please do subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Uh, A couple things I want to mention really quickly. We uh, recently appeared on the Rise and Shine podcast. It was a great conversation, a really interesting uh, chat that we had there. We'll put a link to that on this episode's uh, show notes. So if you'd like to go check out that, so the, the tables were turned on us. We had to answer all the questions for once instead of being the ones asking. So that was a lot of fun. And additionally, we want to thank Athletic Brewing Company for being our sponsor. They've uh, been with us for a few weeks now, and I can't say enough good things about them. I, I, it has been so nice having a, a fridge full of delicious, real craft beer without all the alcohol so that, uh, you know, no regrets after having a few. Uh, just a, a nice way to wrap up the summer, especially as the, as the weather starts to change. It's just been uh, really nice having them on board. So thank you to Athletic Brewing Company for sponsoring us. Uh, More information about them as well on our website, thefitmass.com. So that's where you'll find us uh, next week with a brand new episode or wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks so much for listening. We'll see you next time at thefitmass.com. See everyone. We know this podcast is amazing and does not seem to lack anything, but we do need a legal disclaimer. Jeremy and Zach are not doctors. They do not play them on the Internet, and even if they did play them on the Internet, they would be really bad at it. Please consult your physician prior to implementing any changes that you heard on this podcast. The listener assumes that Jeremy and Zach do not know what they are talking about and that you will do your own research on the topics talked about on this podcast.